Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding and delighted to welcome you. This is our first event of the new year, not of the academic year. So I'd certainly like to begin by wishing everyone a very happy and healthy new year and certainly glad to see a standing room only crowd. That's always uh, very, very good news. Uh, for anyone who is standing up, uh, we do have an overflow room right across, you know, the hallway here. So, you know, if you do want to sit down, uh, there are seats in the overflow room uh, right across um, the hallway. I'm particularly delighted to see such a large crowd. Uh, we're competing with, I think, every candidate, you know, on the face of the earth. Uh, and I think even Bill Clinton is speaking in five minutes at the uh, hand. And I shouldn't say that. I don't want anybody to get up and walk out. He's, he's, he began a half an hour ago. But anyway, uh, I'm just, again, delighted that uh, so many of you are here. And I think you're here uh, for a very, very good reason. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, in working with Professor uh, Daryl Press, who will introduce George Packer in just a moment, uh, Daryl is a professor of government, international relations in the government department, and also the, um, the chair of the War and Peace Studies program at the Dickey Center. But uh, we wanted very much uh, to have George come here because uh, I probably will speak just for myself, but I'm sure for Daryl as well. Uh, it's unfortunate, I think, that Iraq, you know, has sort of gone off the headlines. It's a critical issue, and uh, I know of no one better than, than George <coughs> Packer writing about Iraq, so we're delighted, you know, that he's going to be, going to be speaking here today. But um, uh, we are going to be having a series of excellent programs, the Dickey Center, uh, through the course of this year, uh, the winter and, and uh, spring terms. And I invite you all to check our web pages, to stop by the Dickey Center, to call any of us. Uh, but we're going to be having a series of very, very good programs, not the least of which is a continuation of what we've been doing on the subject of climate change and security. Uh, we've got Professor Ronald Schneider from uh, Stanford University coming uh, in January. I think it's the 22nd. And then Rita Colwell, the former director of the National Science Foundation, will be here, uh, I think it's February 18th, uh, to talk about uh, climate change and the spread of disease, which is another, you know, new phenomenon that, you know, has not been focused on. But that's all for another time. Uh, let me turn the program now over to Daryl Press, uh, who will introduce uh, George Packer. Daryl. Thank you, Ken. Um, as Ken said, I'm Daryl Press. I teach in the government department here, and I'm the coordinator of the Dickey Center's War and Peace Studies program. I have to say, when I first ho heard that George Packer would be speaking here today, I was very pleasantly surprised because I hadn't even heard that he declared his candidacy for president. <laughs> um, but I'm very, very pleased to welcome him here. Um, Mr. Packer has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 2003, and he covered the Iraq War for that magazine. Um, his book on the Iraq War, let me just say, is, is a fantastic book. Um, it's called The Assassin's Gate, America and Iraq, and it was named one of the 10 best books of 2005 by The New York Times. Um, he's written extensively about a whole series of topics, about civil conflict in West Africa, about American politics, about literature. Um, and today, he's going to come here and talk to us about Iraq. So, um, oh, one other thing. Um, in addition to uh, writing books and covering the Iraq War and um, uh, being dad to Charlie there in the first row, he's also somehow found a way uh, to write a play. His play, Betrayed, is um, starting in, in a month, in, in about two weeks in New York. So. Um, my gosh, a, a busy guy. But uh, he's going to talk to us about Iraq, and I'd, I'd ask you to please join me in giving a uh, heartfelt welcome to Mr. George Packer. Thank you so much, Daryl, Ken, uh, all of you. I'm honored. I'm amazed that you're here. Um, I think, for better or worse, this is a symbol of the end of the Clinton era if you're here <laughs> and not um, <clears throat> hearing the ex-president talk. Um, I will be briefer than the ex-president, um, and I am on time. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know that I'll be able to give you um, 
the good news that I imagine he's going to try to, to give you, um, because my topic is not um, prone to good news. Um, and I want to recognize my wife, Laura, and our three and a half month old, Charlie. Uh, if you hear any screaming, I hope it's going to be Charlie who's <laughs> doing it. But he's been awfully good through three campaign events in the last two days, so I, let's hope he's on his best behavior for his dad. Um, Laura and I have been sort of sampling what New Hampshire has to offer every four years because we don't get to in New York. We have been, uh, like the rest of the country, um, disenfranchised of the right to see candidates in the flesh and ask them impertinent questions. You have that right. You probably know how lucky you are, but I'm going to tell you how lucky you are. Laura and I have now made it a sort of quadrennial pilgrimage to come up here and see the candidates since we don't get to do it in New York. And it's an absolutely great experience, and we've seen in the last uh, 36 hours John McCain, Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama. And it's given me something to think about in terms of Iraq because Iraq has come up in each of those events, but not much. And it reinforces this strange impression I have that somehow the war is ending without being over, ending for us. It's ending in public consciousness, or at least it's fading. Uh, it's off the front pages. It's out of the evening news, by and large. Unless you are over there or you know someone over there, um, or you're just an unusually conscientious person, there's no real reason to be thinking about Iraq these days. Um, and that's reflected in the campaign. Um, of those three candidates, John McCain by far devoted the most time to it. Why is that? Well, I think because um, he's now claiming that he was right all along, that we can and will win, and that everyone who said otherwise um, shouldn't be president of the United States. In other words, he's actually basing his campaign largely on Iraq, which is a remarkable thing. Six months ago, it seemed like folly and suicide. Now, um, who knows? But yesterday, he said some true things, uh, such as that there have been some improvements in Iraq in the last few months, and that they have to be taken into account and understood. And some things that I think are dubious, such as uh, we have to fight them there or else we'll be fighting them over here because they'll follow us home. Um, and that there is such a thing still as victory in Iraq. I don't think there is such a thing as victory in Iraq. Um, the other Republicans never mention Iraq, uh, the leading ones at least. And I think this is because they never really stuck their necks out to defend the president's policy, but they didn't want to have any real distance from the president's policy either because they're trying to capture the same Republican base, which still more or less supports the president. And so they talk about terrorism, they talk about Al-Qaeda, they talk about 9-11 endlessly. They don't really talk about Iraq. They don't tell you what they will do about the fact that we're engaged still in a major land war that's been going on for almost five years when they get into the Oval Office. So there's a strange silence on the Republican side. Stranger still is the fact that, I mean, if you think about 1968, which was the last year we held a presidential election in the middle of a deeply unpopular war, that election produced a huge split in the Democratic Party um, and a significant anti-war wing of the Democratic Party uh, represented mainly by Eugene McCarthy, who um, made himself famous here in New Hampshire in 68, um, and to a lesser extent by Bobby Kennedy. Um, but in, in any event, the Democratic Party came close to self-destructing over the Vietnam War. The Republican Party seems prepared to nominate a candidate who will run on four more years of the same. And it's I don't, I don't quite know what it says about the difference between Democrats and Republicans that rather than self-destructing over Iraq, the Republicans are pretending that it doesn't exist. Um, I think sooner or later there will be a reckoning for that party, maybe sooner rather than later, and um, it won't be pretty because um, Iraq has been in every way a Republican war, a war that was fought 
it was sold and fought in a partisan way. And so the Republican Party, I think, will inevitably carry the consequences, whatever Dick Cheney will tell the country after he leaves office about who stabbed who in the back. Um, the Democrats have one line about the Iraq war, and it is, when I become president, I will end the war and bring the troops home. That's now become the line of all the major Democrats. It's the only line. I don't hear anything else, at least we didn't hear it yesterday and today. That too is strange to me. Um, one line about the war, along with health care, energy, education, jobs, um, trade, as if the war is just one of, of many items in the usual policy laundry list. What does it mean to end the war? It, to me, this is as misleading and empty a word as John McCain's victory, because it's one of my, um, Charlie. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something I've come to feel about this war. It will not end. Whether we have 160,000 troops there or not, it will not even end for us, let alone for Iraqis. It will be with us in a way that Vietnam was not with us after 1975. That war really ended. We came home. We made movies. We argued about it. We licked our wounds. We built a wall. Iraq is not going to be so simple. It, it is going to remain a political, a security, an economic, a human problem for decades. So to talk about ending the war and bringing the troops home um, leaves me a little cold because I want to hear more. And, and later we'll, we'll talk about what else we need to hear. So to sum up on the campaign, Iraq is this elephant in the room that no one really has very much to say about. And it, it's a remarkable thing. A five-year war, a presidential election, it's a minor issue. Um, it may not even really figure in the fall campaign. It may not be one of the top three or four issues that the candidates talk about. Um, and perhaps when we get to questions, one of you would like to propose a theory of why this is, how this could be. One theory I have, which I want to talk about today, um, this absence of Iraq from the political debate has to do with a wish that Iraq simply go away, that, or that it be simple, that it be a lot simpler than it actually is, and that there be no really difficult long-term consequences, whatever we do. Um, the, this wish, for me, is connected to and made possible by the, in the public discussion and in the media, by the remoteness of the Iraq war. The title of this lecture is the, the Iraq, the remote war. What do I mean by remote? Well, first of all, for me, it's a visual thing. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked after returning from one of my trips to Iraq, what does it look like over there? And at first it seemed like a strange question. Well, there's more television crews and photographers than, <laughs> you know, in New York and Los Angeles put together. What do you mean, what does it look like? Well, I can't picture it. And that's true, people can't picture it. And I've been thinking about this for quite a while and wondering what does it mean that people can't picture it? I think partly it's that, the photographs have this same quality over and over again of sun wash, because Iraq is so sun washed, and formless. The landscape seems to be sort of crumbling and not to have any particular features. It's a flat desert. Um, the buildings look alike. The people are usually seen at a distance. Um, there is nothing by way of photography. Um, and by the way, there's some great photographers working in Iraq, and I know some of them but somehow their pictures have not stuck in the way that Robert Kappas from Omaha Beach stuck and defined World War II, or the way that um, <clears throat> Nick Utz's picture, his famous picture of, of children fleeing a napalm attack, stuck and defined Vietnam. I can't think of a single professional photographer's image that will define Iraq in the same way. Um, partly, I think, because we journalists are kept far away from Iraqis by fear, mutual fear. And that has been 
a developing, deteriorating reality from the beginning, it, at first it was much easier to move around, to talk to people, to spend hours with them. But over time, it became harder and harder, and this was the strategy of the insurgents, and it was an extremely successful one. It made both sides <coughs> terrified of being seen with the other. Um, the U.S. military has also grown much shrewder about how to control the press in war zones than it was during Vietnam. <laughs> Although there's a fair amount of freedom to, to wander, if you dare, um, photographs of casualties are now almost impossible to publish. You have to get the signature of a wounded soldier before you can publish a photograph of him. And who is gonna press a piece of paper into the face of somebody who's lying on the ground bleeding? Um, and as for a dead soldier, his family has to be notified. And there's all sorts of issues that the military now raises about honoring their privacy, which I think has a grain of truth to it, but is mainly a way for the public not to see pictures of the dead and the wounded. And we don't. Uh, you have to go out of your way to see them, although they are available. Um, and, and it's shocking when you do, because you realize how sanitized the war is. It's not that the press isn't doing its job. It's that the military has figured out um, that it doesn't have to have um, bad news plastered across the front pages every day. Um, so Iraq, the image of Iraq is flickering and it's formless. Um, and there's a kind of a, a blank space where the mental picture of Iraq should be in, in the public's mind. The, the most famous images of Iraq were taken by non-professionals. In fact, by combatants, the digital photos from Abu Ghraib taken by military police on the night shift, the jihadi beheading videos that turned up on websites um, featuring Zarqawi and his men. These are the defining images of the Iraq war. And they are photography as terror and humiliation. They are not about documenting and witnessing as the great photojournalism of the past century has been about. They are about scaring, about humiliating, degrading, and achieving political ends in the process. <clears throat> but it's not only a visual problem, this remoteness. <clears throat> it's a consequence of how the war has been fought, of its politics, and of our political culture the political culture of America at war, which really means all of us. What are the elements of this culture and this politics that have, create, that have made Iraq seem so distant to most of us? The all-volunteer military, which means you really have to want to, in a sense, to get involved in this thing. If you don't want to, you can sort of make it somebody else's business. It, there are hundreds of thousands of soldiers and their families for whom it's very personal and very real. But for most Americans, we've been given a free pass. Our taxes have been cut. We've been told to go shopping. Uh, we've essentially been told, don't worry about it. Leave it to us. Leave it to the experts. Leave it to the professional military, um, which has sent a signal that um, this is not a great national uh, concern, that this actually is, is a rather small thing, and I think that has been absorbed, and that, has, that lesson has, in a sense, been registered. I think it was a very deliberate message sent by the administration from the outset. They never leveled with the public about what this would cost, what the risks were, what the price might be. Uh, instead, we were told it would be a short war, it would pay for itself, Iraqi oil would reconstruct the country. Um, and our troops would be home by September of 2003. Um, and anyone who said otherwise, uh, such as Lawrence Lindsay, who is one of Bush's economic advisors, who had a too high a price tag, although it wasn't nearly high enough, or General Eric Shinseki, who said it would take several hundred thousand troops to secure Iraq, were fired. So I, I would say a very deliberate PR strategy to minimize what this war would mean for the country. So the public was never prepared for it, was never prepared for a long, difficult fight. Um, the treatment of 
of casualties, which I mentioned, of caskets, which can't be photographed or filmed. So we can't even see the coffins with the American flags on them as they arrive at Dover Air Force Base. The fact that the president doesn't go to funerals means that the funerals don't get much attention. Um, all of this has, in a sense, divested the public of responsibility. Um, and it seemed to be a clever strategy for a little while because the administration got its war and got about two more years than it deserved of public confidence in the way the war was being fought. Um, the election of 2004 should have turned on the fact that the Iraq war had become a disaster. Anyone who spent time there in 2004 knew that it had become a disaster. But the public didn't really know, or at least a lot of the public, or knew but didn't really want to believe it couldn't be turned around in the way that people, I think, understandably, and I'm sympathetic to it, don't want to think that it's just all for nothing. So President Bush was reelected. I think the turning point was Katrina, because suddenly a disaster was unfolding in an American city with Anderson Cooper there to tell you what was happening. And what had been happening in slow motion in Iraq for two years happened in fast motion in New Orleans for a week. And if you look at the polls, that was when the bottom fell out of support for the war. Again, it suggests something remote and almost unreal, that it took a flood in an American city to tell people that the Iraq war um, was, was failing. And <clears throat> the bottom fell out very quickly, far faster than in Vietnam, when it took about three or four years. And support for that war never fell below 50%, as it has in this case. Um, in this case, it took a, a couple of months, a few months. And I think it's because the administration never committed the country to this, never explained why it was necessary, never said this involves all of us and this is what we're asking of you. Instead, it said this war will be a glorious and brief and short victory. And so everything turned on the administration with equal speed. <clears throat> the administration created a false narrative about the war, and that narrative kept changing, as we all know. But part of the remoteness of this war has been the counter-narrative that has risen up in response to the administration's false narratives. And in this counter-narrative, the invasion was the original sin, and nothing could follow but more evil. It, in a way, in its simplicity, its moral simplicity, it reflects the original narrative of the administration. Um, to the pro-war side, criticism, and I've experienced this personally, had to be motivated by partisanship and defeatism at best, maybe even treason, which is a word that gets used all too often these days. Um, and the effect of this mindset, which was encouraged by the White House with signals and wakes and nods, was to make it impossible to hold anyone accountable so that we had a Secretary of Defense in office for three years presiding over disastrous strategy, um, which now everyone in the White House admits was a disaster because General Petraeus has come up with a better one. But there were people who were saying that for years and they were defeatists. Um, it meant that no general could be held accountable for the war. Because if you held a general accountable, it meant that the war might not be going so well. And so no one was fired. No one. Eisenhower fired <laughs> dozens of officers in the first few months of the North Africa campaign because he very quickly found out under the stress of combat who was capable of leading and who was not. In Iraq, no one has been fired. Um, and one lieutenant colonel, very brave lieutenant colonel named Paul Yingling, um, wrote an article signed under his own name. He was accused by his peers of committing car a career suicide bombing. The article is called A Failure of Generalship. And in it he said, 
a private is more likely to be fired for losing his rifle than a general for losing a war. That's the nature of the military today. Bureaucratic, careerist, an organization of yes men where you only rise if you please those above you. You please those above you by being a good company man. Some of the best officers in the war, I would cite H.R. McMaster, a colonel, had been passed over for promotion because they were not good company men, because they were actually telling journalists like me the truth about the war. This has cost them dearly. But that's been the tone set from the very top, and it's gone on down across the board. The military, the intelligence agencies, the foreign service, <coughs> and certainly the political arm of the White House have all treated this war rather like a, a PR battle in which if you win the day's uh, news cycle, and get it spun the right way, you've, in a sense, achieved victory in Iraq. And so the worst thing is for bad news to begin to seep out or up. So there's a series of filters in place as bad news does seep up. And if <coughs> you are the source of it, you had really better watch out. You will become known as someone who isn't on the team. And eventually, you'll be replaced. You don't get fired for, for doing badly. You only get fired for telling the truth. That is perhaps a good way to run a campaign, although I doubt it. It's a terrible way to run a war because there are facts in Iraq that don't care about our news cycle, that will go on existing in spite of who wins the day's news cycle. But the Bush administration treated this war tactically as a series of short-term victories, mission accomplished, the capture of Saddam, the transfer of sovereignty, the elections, the death of Zarqawi, and then they ran out of short-term victories and had no, nothing to uh, sort of justify themselves, and the public turned against the war. But I would argue that the counter-narrative has been equally guilty of a, a kind of simplified thinking <clears throat> that cannot see this, this war in its entirety. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. I and others who began going to Iraq in 2003 realized that whatever else the war had or hadn't been about, it was now about the fact that ordinary Iraqis, and especially Iraqis who were doctors, lawyers, journalists, women's activists, human rights activists, trade unionists, everyone whom in, or, in other cases progressives in the West support and show solidarity with and have letter writing campaigns for, were being killed <coughs> systematically in, a, in one of the most brutal terror campaigns that we've seen in a long time. And this was an effort to destroy the little shoots of civil society <coughs> that were beginning to grow, even in occupied Iraq at war. And the response from the West, including the progressive West, was generally silence, was generally well, what does that matter? Look at what happened at Abu Ghraib, as if Iraq could only be about one thing. And this puzzled me, and over time it began to really trouble me, because I consider myself part of the progressive left, and yet I would come back from Iraq with my head bursting with stories of Iraqis who were trying to make something of the opportunity that had been conferred on them by invasion. That is the truth. It's a strange <coughs> phrase. It sounds like a paradox. It is a paradox. I've always believed that to understand this war, you have to be able to hold contradictory ideas in your head at the same time. But back home, it wasn't something that friends of mine, people I knew, particularly wanted to hear about because it complicated things. It made the simple counter-narrative less compelling. Um, the basic idea was the war should never have been thought, fought at all, so I don't know why these Iraqis are worth fighting for now. Ah, uh, the little meltdown. <laughs> I know I'm not Barack Obama, Charlie. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> So this 
these two narratives, um, in their simplicity, have affected so much of the way the war has been presented. For example, the media. Um, there have been huge media failures on this war. We all know that. The failure in the pre-war period to question the administration's rationale will go down as one of the great journalistic failures of all time. And I listed those institutions that have failed us in the war. I would say the press failed us too. The institutions that have failed are not merely government. Some non-governmental ones have as well. But I think the war coverage itself has been very good. Um, I know a lot of them. I know exactly how dangerous it is for them to do what they do. And it is unbelievably dangerous beyond anything that the press in Vietnam experienced because we are the target. <laughs> we are wanted. We are hunted. We have to dye mustaches and wear black abayas and travel around in armored cars with chase cars and armed guards just to go interview a women's rights activist. So that's what covering the Iraq war has meant. And and yet it, it has persisted, and the, the best have done it incredibly well, but they haven't really been recognized. And I think the reason is the better they cover the war, the less they please both sides. People want one, one version or the other of the war, and anyone who's covering it well is eventually going to tell you something that you don't want to hear. And I don't generalize about all of us far from it, but in the media, the way the war has been reflected, it has been a kind of a war between the two narratives. And if you lean too far one way, you'll be called to task for it by pundits and opinion makers and told that you're, you're aping the administration line. If you lean too far the other way, a whole other set of pundits and opinion makers will call you to task and say that you are a defeatist, that you don't want America to win, that it's journalists like you who are keeping the troops from doing their job and who aren't reporting the good news. I hear this all the time. I heard it yesterday at a McCain event from a very nice nurse who didn't know that I was a journalist who had covered the Iraq war. Um, <clears throat> so you can't win. I have a friend f from the New York Times, Dexter Filkins, who's one, I think, of the handful of really the very best. He went into Fallujah in November 2004 with the Marines. It was the most intense urban warfare Americans have seen since Vietnam. And because of the miracles of modern technology, he was able to set up a satellite modem, run off a car battery, and download email responding to that morning's article that he had sent. And the email included letters from readers saying, you journalists need to get off your asses and go see the war because what I hear is that our troops have taken Fallujah and your report that you're only 100 meters into the city is just false. There's Dexter Filkins in the city with mortar fire raining down on him, downloading emails and hearing that he's, he's lazy and, um, and has no journalistic integrity. So it's a, it's a strange situation where um, the facts that are so hard to get and that are never completely objective, there's no such thing, um, are not welcome particularly and are instead become fodder for a tremendous argument over which facts to believe. A um, couple of examples from last summer that came up at the same time uh, that struck me because they showed this happening <coughs> quite vividly. Um, a soldier began writing articles for the New Republic online. And immediately, um, right-wing blogs and, and magazines attacked his, his credibility, said that this can't be. There's no way that what he's describing, such as soldiers trying to run over dogs in their Humvees or mocking corpses, could possibly happen. This is because the right-wing bloggers have never seen a war. Um, nonetheless, they, it, it, it was imperative to discredit him. Um, of course, a whole other group immediately defended him. The reverse happened when an op-ed was published in the Times by two analysts who admittedly did not spend very much time in Iraq and reported that things were going better. This was Ken Pollack and Mike Lohanlon. Immediately, a whole set of bloggers attacked them, listed all the things that they said in the past that were wrong. A whole other set defended them and attacked the attackers. And eventually, you sort of lost sight of what we're talking about. And the fact that both of these pictures of the war might be true, or at least have some truth to them, because the war is 
vast, it's complicated. In wars, soldiers do bad things. In wars, things take turns for the better. This seemed to be impossible in the political culture in which these things were happening. Um, so in this mindset, it's as if a portion of the public is less susceptible to the power of facts, difficult facts, than it was, say, in 1963, which is why Dexter Filkins will not be remembered the way David Halberstam is remembered. I don't think it's because Dexter Filkins isn't the reporter David Halberstam was. I think it's because 1963 is not 2003. Something's changed in our culture. And I, I, I would say to sum up that change, the Iraq War has become another battlefield of wars that were going on here long before we ever reached Baghdad. The culture wars, the partisan wars, the Monaco wars, the impeachment wars, the Florida recount wars. We all know what those wars have been. They've been political wars. Barack Obama has now made it his signature that he will end those wars. But for the period of 2003 to the present, Iraq got caught up in what was essentially an American Civil War, and it became extremely difficult for Americans to see it, to see it clearly on its own terms, not on our terms, on its own terms, which are constantly changing. I haven't been there since January. That's a year. That means the war has probably gone through three or four dramatic new cycles, and I will not pretend to be able to tell you what's happening in Iraq today. It would be it would be false because this war is a kaleidoscope. Um, the intensity of this propaganda fight over Iraq, all wars have their propaganda fights at home. The intensity in this case seems to me not a sign of how high the stakes are for those who are engaged in it, but rather that the stakes are actually low for them, that they have nothing personal at stake, that they're at a comfortable remove so that the truth can always line up on their side, because it can't if you're close to it. Um, and in these magazine offices and bloggers' bedrooms and in Hollywood studios and in the White House, a sort of fantasy war has taken hold, in which it, one saw either a continuous display of military virtue or an endless series of crimes against humanity. In both cases, a product of, I would say, a thick layer of insulation against reality. So to come back to the election and to conclude, what should the candidates have to be addressing? What questions should they have to face? And I'm not going to give you answers. Maybe I'll try if you ask me direct questions afterward, but I'm not running for anything, um, on, contrary to what Daryl told you. Um, I'll, I'll put them as questions, and then maybe we'll talk about them. Here are the questions that, for me, are essential to understanding and the war and to knowing what one would face on January 20th, 2009, as president. What kind of real questions any president will have to answer. Um, the first is, what is the meaning of the recent improvements? Why have they occurred? And what is their durability? And is there anything that America and our 160,000 troops and our diplomats can do to make them more durable? Or have we become, as some Iraqis have told me, irrelevant in Iraq because it's not really about us anymore? <clears throat> Two, what is the long-term political outlook in Iraq? Is this country headed for Somalia, for Afghanistan? Will we be looking at little pockets of order imposed by warlords and militia leaders in their little corners of the city or the province, surrounded by vast areas of no man's land in which roving gangs of criminals and uh, other armed groups, with some help from neighboring countries, um, battle each other out for control over resources. This is sort of the Mad Max scenario, and I think it's quite possible. Or is there still some way that Iraq could be a, a country 
which Iraqis um, will tell you absolutely is possible. They believe it. They feel it. It's a very nationalistic place. And when candidates talk glibly about dividing it up into three, like King Lear with his kingdom, um, I imagine an Iraqi being in the room and hearing it. It's far too um, easy and presumptuous. And what's more, there's no way an American is going to do it. And you don't hear Iraqis saying they want it very often. So um, we have to contend with their, their feelings. War is partly about that. And in this case, Iraqis want a country. The question is, can they have it? Or has it gone too far? Have we allowed this civil war to go um, so far out of control that there is um, no way to put it back together again, no way to build up a central government that's capable of running that country? In which case, what's our role at all? And should we be training <laughs> Iraqi security forces who eventually will be loyal to militia leaders rather than to the government? How do we weigh political pressures at home with our interests? Um, which comes down to some very brutal calculations about casualties and what the American public can tolerate and will tolerate um, in balance against what America's interests in Iraq are and remain. And what are those interests? Some people don't like to talk about them. Well, I think we have to talk about our interests. <clears throat> They're mainly negative interests um, in the sense that a regional war fought along sectarian lines is not in our interest. That's a possibility. It's something the presidential candidate should have to talk about, how it can be prevented, um, how, what effect withdrawing American combat units would have on the possibility of a regional war. Al-Qaeda, which is certainly on the run in Iraq now, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, I should say, which is very much a local organization, which didn't exist before we arrived, but which now does exist, and which has ties to international Al-Qaeda, and which has been extremely um, effective in destabilizing, in destroying the country. It's now on the run. What effect would our withdrawal have on its return? What effect would it have on the fact that Sunni tribes and leaders have decided that it is in their short-term interest right now to join forces with us because their larger enemy, Al-Qaeda, and their even larger enemy, the Shiite government and Iran, are less of a threat than we are, or rather are more of a threat than we are. At what point will our departure convince them that Al-Qaeda is once again they're the enemy of their enemy and therefore their friend. And what will that mean for Iraq, for the region, and for us? What about the refugees? There are now two million Iraqis in the Middle East uh, as refugees, two million more in their own country. And we hear stories that they're coming back. I think the numbers are, are small. And what I hear anecdotally from Iraqi friends is that they're coming back mainly because they've run out of money and because they know that they're never going to get a job in Jordan, and their children are not going to get to go to school in Damascus. And if they hear a bit of good news from their old neighborhood in Baghdad, for some people, it's enough to get them to go back. But it's not because all is well. So don't be fooled by that line of argument. Um, all is not well. The stability in Baghdad is a very thin veneer. And as a friend, an Iraqi friend who's still there said to me, under the ashes, there is still a fire. Um, <clears throat> what about the refugees? What can we do to make sure that they don't become a desperate, radicalized diaspora in the Middle East? There's already one of those. They're called the Palestinians. Um, this is simply more gasoline on fires that are really beginning to burn out of control in that region. I'm particularly concerned with Iraqi refugees who actually trusted us enough to work with us. That's what my play is about. Um, they have been hunted down and killed. They have been um, left hung out to dry by the American authorities in Iraq. They are on the run. I sometimes think of them as the like the European Jews of World War II. They have no friends. They are being hunted down by everybody. They are defenseless. I think we owe it to them to make it possible and not onerous to come here if they have no way of surviving in their own country. The administration has made it almost impossible. It's one of the great disgraces of the war. 
Um, it is a disgrace on the order of the State Department keeping out the European Jews in World War II. What do the candidates think about those Iraqis who are in the thousands and their future and whether they should be uh, brought here, which is not going to be politically popular, believe me. As Richard Armitage said to me, the president spent the last six years scaring the hell out of the American people about Islam and Arabs. Why would he suddenly turn around and bring thousands of them here? And finally, what will be the effect of our ability to lead if we stay in Iraq or if we leave Iraq? And I think there will be good and bad effects in either case. Neither case is cost-free. There are no good answers. There is nothing that's going to simply repair the damage. And to those who imagine a withdrawal repairing the damage, what if what we leave behind is a level of violence on a scale that we haven't seen before, with Al Jazeera broadcasting it around the world? Our troops will be out of harm's way. Iraqis will not. Will we seem to be a country that is, has rejoined the civilized world, that has re-earned its place as a decent country with a decent respect for the opinion of mankind? Or will we seem to have finally um, committed the last atrocity against Iraq? I'm not sure of the answer, but I think the question has to be faced. All these questions do. You're New Hampshireites. It's the last hour. It's not too late. I would urge you to think about these things when you meet the candidates, when you vote, and um, on to November. So thank you all very much for your attention. And um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer all of them, but I'll try. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the provocative, um, the provocative word. I'm going to call on people, and the people who've been um, filming this have asked me to repeat the questions that are asked, and because I'm not mic'd up, to repeat them very loud. So what's going to happen is I'm going to call on somebody. They're going to ask a nice question, and then I'm going to shout it back to you, and then Mr. Pack will answer. Then I'm going to follow our tradition, which is. Absolutely. Um, I'm also going to do what we normally do, and I'm going to try to uh, call on students first. So are there any students out there who have any questions for Mr. Packard? A Dartmouth student? <laughs> yeah, graduate student. Great, excellent. <laughs> I'm a uh, graduate uh, master's public health student here at Dartmouth, and uh, I'm actually a 240 golf gunner in the Marine Corps as well, and I served uh, a year overseas in, uh, in Somalia, so I can assure you that this war is taking place in other lands that we may not hear about every day on CNN. Um, two things that I want to say real quick. One was that, yes, this war is taking place in other places. I personally have seen it and fought it. Um, and two, that we hear a lot in the news, and I hear a lot of people in Hanover say it all over this really great line, which is, you know, I'm against the war, but I support the troops. And uh, I just wanted to implore all of you to think about that. And when you think about it, think about it in terms of what have you done to really support the troops? Because for us, this war isn't really about politics, and you raise some great points, and, and they're all very salient. But for us, that's not really that's not from our footsteps. So, what have you done for them? And, and you know, more than just saying thank you, you know, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's walking up to them and shaking their hand and saying, you know, thank you for doing something you maybe you didn't want to do. Because I signed up well before September 11th ever happened, or well before Iraq ever happened. So that wasn't something that was on my radar when I joined the Marine Corps. So, whether or not I wanted to go there, that's not up to me now. So. You know, thank those soldiers and, and thank all the, the guys and, and women now that are over there. And just, you know, do what you can for them because the, all this isn't up to them. So a corporal in the Marine Corps doesn't get to make these decisions and doesn't get to say, you know what, I've had enough, I'm going to go home. He's behind a machine gun and he's doing what he's, because he is a yes man. That's all, that's the only option he has. So just think about that and, and please, if you, you know, care packages and letters, those are the things that really help us get through those days is, is those things and knowing that you guys are thinking about it. So. To, to summarize for the video audience, the first um, point was simply a comment from, um, from somebody uh, asking us all to think about ways that we can all individually support the troops who are deployed in Iraq. Um, do we have a student in the back? Yes, sir? Um, in Kansas debate, I think on Saturday, the Democratic debate, um, they're talking about the success of the surge. Many of the candidates would agree that the surge is working. Everyone lockstep said that um, no, because it was meant to build a breathing room for political progress. Um, you said that there is such a thing. 
um, as strong Iraqi nationalism and do have its identity. Um, then why don't you think that we do see this um, political reconciliation happening in Baghdad that's going to allow Iraq to be a centralized state? So the question was about why we have not yet seen more political reconciliation in Iraq given the level of nationalism in the country. That's a great question. Um, and what I would say is no country is genetically programmed to uh, descend into genocidal killing. It's, that's a political act. It is a consequence of leadership. And Iraq has, and, and Iraqis have had the great misfortune, um, for which they may bear some blame, of having terrible leadership. And this goes back to before the war. This goes back to Saddam, who used ethnicity and sect as a way to control and to divide, who created a kind of subterranean um, <clears throat> animosity among the groups in that country that did not need to explode into near genocidal killing. But American mistakes, uh, the concerted effort of Al Qaeda with its spectacular campaign of mass murder, and above all, bad Iraqi leadership has brought Iraq to that point. Um, and it is a refrain I hear all the time from ordinary people of every background that they lived together before all of this happened, but it was their leaders who have led them to this, and they don't trust their leaders at all. That goes across the board. That may be the thing that unites Iraqis. Uh, one Iraqi man suggested to me that that might be the one thing that holds the country together is a common revulsion against their own leadership, which may well be true of this country as well. Um, <clears throat> and. The question is, has it now gone too far? I mean, there, there are some irrevocable things in history. Um, I'm not sure it was necessary that uh, the Balkans descend into genocidal killing in the 90s. That, too, was about politics and leadership. But it went far enough that it may be impossible to put it back together again. In some ways, it is. In some parts of the Balkans, it is. Has Iraq gone that far? I don't know. Um, that's a decision, in a sense, that Iraqis will have to make themselves, but it's a mistake to believe that this is an ancient conflict that they've been fighting for 1,400 years over who had the proper succession of the caliphate after the Prophet Muhammad. That's sort of the easy shorthand to, in a sense, I think, wash our own hands of the responsibility we bear, um, because they weren't talking about the early caliphate when I arrived in 2003. They were in 2006, but that's because in those three years, um, Iraqis were failed by us and by their own leaders. So that's the best I can do to answer the question of why there's nationalism and civil war at the same time. Uh, yes, sir, standing up. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, leadership and uh, mentioning you know, sort of the significance of the upcoming presidential primaries and stuff. And um, I was just wondering uh, your thoughts on how effectively uh, we as voters and as citizens can uh, affect you know, positive change in Iraq through the presidential primaries and through the office. You know, so the question was, what can individual um, Americans do to either affect U.S. Um, policy toward Iraq or to affect things on the ground in Iraq? Well, you know, I read a transcript of an exchange that John McCain had with a New Hampshire man named Dave Tiffany that was absolutely fascinating. Um, and this is, you have to hand it to John McCain. He engaged that man for what seemed like about 10 minutes in a back and forth. Neither of them really gave an inch. John McCain said, if we leave, it will be a surrender and Al Qaeda will be the winner. Dave Tiffany said, how long are we going to be there? Uh, what's your justification? Where's the light at the end of the tunnel? John McCain said, maybe 100 years. It was actually one of the more candid moments of the campaign. Um, Dave Tiffany said, by the way, I hope you kick Romney's butt. Um, John McCain said, oh, now I know why I called on you. It was actually a, one, a great exchange, and it's made possible by the New Hampshire primary. It can't happen any other place. So that's, that's the best I can do. Just hold their feet to the fire. Ask a question. Ask a follow-up. Force them to get beyond their own sound bites, because this issue, above all, is the one they really don't want to have to get into too much detail about, because it's too painful. I think Richard Nixon must have been a genius to get elected in 68 by 
intimating that he had a plan to end the war without saying a secret plan, without saying anything about it, and seemed to convince everyone that he was on their side. And of course, we found out that that wasn't the case, but it was too late by then. That's, that's what everyone running in this campaign wants to do as well. It's the only way to, to prevent them from hiding behind that kind of smoke screen is to smoke them out. And it's, it's the press's job too. And I am not here to defend the press in every respect. And I think our political press leaves a lot to be desired on this count as well as on some others. Yes, ma'am, standing in the back. You said that you were very distressed when you came back from the peak trip to Iraq with the response of your friends in the country, your progressive leftists who say, we don't care about these intellectual lawyers, etc. I know you haven't been in Iraq for a year, but what do those same people, if they're alive, say mm. about they, what they want us to do at this point now? What do they want us to do? So the question was, what can the United States do now about trying to save the people, the progressives in Iraq, the people who are working um, to try to uh, advance these causes that we were pushing in Iraq? What can we do today for them? Right. You, you might call them the Iraqi Democrats, small d. Um, for many of them, it's too late. They're either dead or they have left the country. And that's been one of the great tragedies of the war, the Iraqi middle class, the Iraqi educated class, the professionals, the backbone of any civil society have basically left the country. Um, they're in Syria, they're in Jordan, they're in Sweden, which has generously uh, admitted over 20,000 Iraqis, uh, which again is a shame to us, great shame to us. Um, <clears throat> they're not in Iraq. And, and if they are, they're in hiding and they can't really function. So they are out of the picture. They have no militia, they have no warlord, they have no um, imam, they have no one, they, and they don't have us to defend them. So they are the Iraqis who have been sort of left without a, uh, a defender. And in that country, if you don't have someone who will, uh, who will kill for you, then your life is pretty cheap. But. What I do hear from them and have heard all along is, we want you to leave. We want to have our country back. We, this is a humiliation to us. We cannot become a sovereign country with an occupying army. But not until you fix the mess that you made. <laughs> it's not a simple message. It's a complicated message, as I've been trying to give to all of you. Um, it leaves it to the listener to decide what that means and what the obligation being conferred is. Um, but it's a way of saying uh, it's not going to be easy for you, no matter what you do. Yes, sir. I've, I've heard the Iraq War compared from time to time to the war in 1984. And my question is, um, to what extent is the way the war has turned out unintended consequences? And to what extent is that it has been such a useful political symbol for so many people? that there really is no incentive to resolving it. It's just something that's very useful to bring up periodically for various political ends. Mm -hmm. that's uh, my the question is, has to do with, uh, I guess, the domestic politics of continuing the war and whether or not it's in the interest of some people in the United States just to continue the war indefinitely. In other words, we're either at war with, Osh uh, with Eurasia or with East Asia. We're no longer at war with East Asia. Now it's Eurasia. So is Iraq sort of a, a way to, in a sense, keep the country frightened and uh, in line. Um, <clears throat> not Iraq, I don't think so. Iraq is a millstone around anyone's neck who is involved in it. I think terrorism is closer to what you're suggesting. Terrorism, which is real, which uh, we all know is real, nonetheless has had enormous political uses. Um, I think part of the interesting um, thing to watch in this election is, has it run out of usefulness? <coughs> Or is there still some mileage left, as Rudy Giuliani hopes, in 9-11? It's been useful to all sides of the political spectrum, to all sorts of countries and political persuasions and the terrorists and you know, the Democrats and the Republicans, they've all found something to use. I think for the Democrats, it's actually been a disaster um, because they have been on the defensive in three straight elections. Um, actually two straight. 2006, I, I would say Iraq overtook terrorism in 2006, and that's why the Democrats finally won an election. 
Um, what will be the case this year? I, I, I don't know. It partly depends on whether there's an attack on the United States, which could really change everything. But uh, while we're talking about Iraq, think about Pakistan. I mean, Iraq is actually manageable <laughs> compared to Pakistan, which has every <laughs> nasty ingredient of, um, of a, a true regional and maybe global problem and seems to be spinning out of control. Um, what do the candidates have to say about Pakistan? Not much, so we'll see. Um, yes, sir, in the red sweater. Uh, a moment ago, you responded that the uh, middle class in exile wants the U.S. to leave, the U.S. Army to leave, but not until we've uh, cleaned up after ourselves. I don't understand how that's possible, starting from where we are. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> or is this just like an impossible task, that we can't leave until we clean up after ourselves, but there's really no way we can clean up after ourselves? So the, the question was, if people in Iraq don't want us to leave until we've cleaned up the mess, is there any possibility we're going to be able to successfully clean up the mess? I mean, that's the big question, isn't it? Um, what do we do? And are we damned if we do and damned if we don't? I think we are damned if we do and damned if we don't. Um, so just to get that out of the way, then the question is, how do you weigh awfulness of outcomes? How do you weigh lives against possible um, consequences? How do you weigh um, past disasters against possible future disasters? Um, I I'm going to wiggle out of this one. I don't have an answer for you. I re I, uh, if I were running for president, I should, but thank God I'm not. Um, I would say, though, that anyone who does have to answer that question should be forced to consider the entire reality that I've been describing, and not one piece of it. Um, if the surge, and the surge is the wrong term because the numbers haven't made the difference. The three things that have mattered in Iraq in the last year have been in order of importance. First, the fact that many Sunnis have decided that al-Qaeda is a greater enemy than the U.S. Second, Muqtada al-Sadr has told the Mahdi army to stand down. So for four months now or so, there's been very little violence from that militia. And third, David Petraeus has instituted a counterinsurgency strategy that does depend to some extent on numbers, but it more depends on where you put your troops and what you have them doing. And it was succeeding to some extent before this in little outposts where imaginative colonels like H.R. McMaster and Talafar were doing it, but it was not Rumsfeld's strategy. It went against Rumsfeld, and so it was essentially uh, ignored. It now has having these small results. Um, I think the candidate should have to say, what will you do to try to make these gains last even as we withdraw our troops? Or is that impossible? Is that trying to have it both ways? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I do think that a timetable in which we've got two brigades a month coming out is probably a recipe for every region that has begun to stabilize to be destabilized again. Now, maybe we have to accept that. It's, Iraq is headed that way anyway. We should cut our losses sooner rather than later. But what I don't like is having a politician tell me that it, we can have a good outcome. Uh, we can get our troops home and leave behind a secure Iraq. We can pull our troops back to Kuwait or Kurdistan and have better counterterror inside Iraq than we have now. To me, that just makes absolutely no sense. It's a kind of fantasy that um, is essentially telling you we can have it pain-free, which we can't. So I'm not going to give you a definitive answer. I will tell you those are the, the key questions that should be answered by the people who will be responsible. Yes, sir. Uh, say a few words about present and future impact of oil in the country. We hear a lot now that there are negotiations by the Kurds with private oil interests. Mm -hmm. It's silly to think they won't be followed up by Right. Feeling so. Right. You've seen tremendous success from oil and other economies, and granted this a little bit. But could that change the complexion of this discussion in a couple of years? So the questioner asked, um, Mr. Packer, to talk a little bit about oil and whether or not um, 
there's some hope that future oil revenues will help change the complexion, I guess, in a positive way in Iraq. Particularly in the different areas, the Kurdish areas. Yeah. You know, oil is more of a curse than a blessing. We all know that. Ask a Nigerian, uh, ask a Venezuelan. Well, very few Nigerians are on the right side of the equation, um, and very few Iraqis are too. And I don't think that oil is going to solve Iraq's problems. Um, but the fact that the Iraqi leadership cannot come to an agreement on the basic oil law, how is it going to be divided up? To what degree will it be federal? To what degree will it be central? Uh, what kind of co deals can the regions make with foreign companies? The Kurds are just going ahead, as the Kurds have been doing in other regards, too, including Kirkuk, which has been resettled by large numbers of Kurds, so that when there's a referendum, Kirkuk is going to vote to join Kurdistan. That's going to lead to some interesting consequences as well. Um, that shows that at the political level, there just doesn't seem to be um, the basis for agreement. Both sides seem to think it's a zero-sum game. If they give, they will get killed. I mean, that's kind of a basic law of nature in Iraq. It has been for a long time. It takes a lot to get people to overcome their fear and mistrust and to sign a law in which they seem to be giving up some control in exchange for um, some kind of end to the, to the conflict. I don't think they're ready to stop fighting. I think there's a lot more fight left. That's my fear. And so an oil law, it's a symptom of, the lack of an oil law is a symptom of the, the political blockage in the country as a, as a whole. The Kurds will figure out a way to it, it, go around that as they, are, as they are now. But oil, just it doesn't solve problems. I, I don't know of any country where oil solves problems. Sure. Uh, yes, sir. Tell that to a journalist in Russian. I, I wanted to um, sort of follow up what you said, but sort of draw up the implications a little differently. Uh, you said, and I think it was, it was completely correct, that nobody lost their job in the military for incompetence and so on and so forth. Uh, and, but then you went on to say that, gosh, we should be listening when uh, Ken Pollack uh, tells us that things are going well. It seems to me that the press also has to suffer consequences, that is to say, uh, Ken Pollock tells me tomorrow is Tuesday. I'm waiting until my computer tells me that it's Tuesday because, you know, everything he said was a complete crock. And it seems in Washington you can't be a failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brzezinski is everywhere despite mm -hmm. his oh, triumphs. Yeah, in other words, there's sort of a, a permanent class of, of, of officials and analysts who never seem to lose their jobs over And, a, and I would add that Crystal just got a, a position at the New York Times yeah. right. the Judith Miller chair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> My point is only that yeah. the press also needs to purge itself in a certain way. It needs to say, look, you did really bad reporting on this. Right. Right. And I'm sorry, your contract is not going to be renewed or we're going to have you covering you know, the Rattlesnake Festival in Delrio, Texas, or something like well, that. Well, Judith Miller is no longer working for the New York Times, so. There are so. many other examples we could give you of people who are You're right. You're absolutely right. I, listen, I agree with what you're saying. There has been lack of accountability across the board, including in the press. The same faces in Washington are telling you the same dubious things as, as they were in 2002 and 2003. Right, right. My point about Ken Pollock was not that he's right or wrong, but that there was an immediate effort to discredit him before that side of the equation had even stopped to consider whether there might be some truth to what he was saying. And actually, I think there was some truth to what he was saying. Um, and there's been other things he's written that have some truth. He's also been spectacularly wrong, as you said. I'm less interested in the sins of this or that individual than in a mindset in which facts that go against one's own view of the war are, rather than being absorbed and taking them through that difficult process of, of rearranging the, the mental structure in which you understand the war, instead, they go like that. And I've just seen it all too often in the press, in politics, um, and, and to some extent in, in, the, in the country, to want to let us off the hook. I think we should all have to face the, uh, what Al Gore calls you know, the inconvenient truth. The what? <clears throat> the inconvenient yeah. truth. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I learned much from what you said, but I want to 
if I may disagree with your basic premise at some level. That's what I'm here for. That the, that the war has had little effect on American society. And maybe you didn't say that, maybe I'm misinterpreting you. But the notion that it's a remote war, that it hasn't, right. that, that it, it, it certainly hasn't affected our day to day lives, and it hasn't affected our patterns of consumption, and so on, which is possible except for oil, uh, and so on. But it seems to me the war has had enormously negative consequences for American society. And that's part of the problem, is that we really haven't faced up to those consequences. I just want to give you a little list, yeah, okay? Go ahead. And I'm, I'm going to be very brief and just try to use I want to hear your list. But, I like what you're saying so far. First so. of all, first of all, the word sovereignty. Does anybody take the word sovereignty seriously anymore? What's the word again? Sovereignty. <laughs> Do we respect the rights of other nations? You know? It seems to me clearly the United States has crossed a barrier. That 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 if the United States wants to do something in the world and can get away with it and do it competently rather than incompetently, it's going to do it. Can, can I challenge you as your list goes no, on or should I wait until no, the no. list is over? <laughs> no. Secondly, and I, know, I know all of these are contested to some, to some degree, but it's remarkable. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make is remarkable how far we've gone. The word torture. Torture. Okay. I know. People argue about it. What's there to really argue is, about? It, it, <laughs> it really is remarkable to me where we have gone as a political society in relationship to that word. Right. Civil liberties. The impact of the war on, and, and the war on terror, and I know they're very much overlapped and intertwined, and, and some have more of one and some have more of the other. The whole question of civil liberties in the United States. And what is the next president going to do to undo some of the damage that mm -hmm. the Bush administration has done? In other words, how much are these things a product of the Bush administration? Right. And how much are they a product of the political culture which the Hillary Clintons and the Barack Obamas, taking out the John Edwards, I hope, uh, uh, will, uh, will mm -hmm. simply inherit and make use of when they feel they need to? Right. John Nichols of the Nation has used a wonderful term that the Bush administration has created a toolbox that it's going to pass on to the next administration, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic administration. And that toolbox is full of precedents and full, full, full now of institutions that have been created and agencies and programs and so on. And they're going to be used in ways that to me are fundamentally antithetical to the human values and even the... I don't, the think, you're, I don't think that you're questioning my premise. I think we're talking about... Let me about... say one other word, Blackwater. <laughs> Got it. Let me just repeat the question for the video. <laughs> I'll give it a brief view. Um, so the questioner was asking whether it was useful to think about the war as a remote war. Perhaps it's closer than we think because it's changing American society and the way we think about it. sovereignty, civil liberties, torture, and presumably mean the privatization of uh, military services. We're talking about two different things. So I don't think you have um, questioned my premise. What I was saying was the country has not taken ownership of the war. The war is something that has, been, has happened, been allowed to happen, because in a sense the country was told to look the other way while it was happening, and has been told it would be easy, and been told that it would be over soon, that it was already over. And once that became clear that it wasn't the case, the argument that followed, uh, I would say, had more to do with our politics than with the war. It had more to do with the Clinton Wars and the Bush Wars um, than it did with Iraq and with the incredible complexity of facts of Iraq. What you're talking about is what the country allowed to happen to it passively as a result of, I would say, not just the Iraq War, but you're right, seven years, six and a half years since September 11th. And that has to do with executive power um, and with a culture of impunity and with a lack of congressional oversight and all sorts of other, as I say, institutional failures. So I still say it's a remote war. It may have crept into our rooms and into our minds without our knowing it, but that's a very different thing from consciously taking it on as ours. It is our war. 
It's the whole country's war. And even if the Bush administration bears the blame for it, we're all left with it now. And it's part of what distresses me that, um, that it, whatever one thinks of it, it that that's sort of been the, where it's been left politically. It's been left at the doorstep of, of one address rather than of all of our addresses. So. <clears throat> I want to ask a question following up on the responsibility of the press. Why have you not covered two things? First, the future Iraq project. That was the plan for Iraq after Saddam fell. Right. Don't disband the army. It was thrown away by Rumsfeld. Why didn't you cover that? Secondly, why haven't you covered Osama's speech of October 29, 2004, when he said we were helping him because he spent $500,000 to set a trap, we took the bait, and it had already cost us $500 billion, and he wants to bankrupt the country, and we're helping him. Why hasn't the press covered that speech? <laughs> uh, the question asked to you. <laughs> that was loud enough. <laughs> Why haven't you read The Assassin's Gate? <laughs> There's an entire chapter on the future of Iraq project. Why haven't you read my book? Why did you come to this talk without having prepared? <laughs> and I can't help you with Osama. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to take one more question, and then we have to. Hey, Why didn't Roger. Your book have warm an echo? Hey, Roger. Um, Blame more, the victim. <laughs> one more question, Katie. But if you're telling us that we must no overcome the politics of cynicism. <laughs> we're, we're damned if, we're, if we do. We're damned if we don't. Why should we worry? Oh, oh, uh, oh. The, the questioner asked if we're in this morass, damned if we do, damned if we don't, then why should we worry? Or presumably, why should we think about things? Are you, are you old enough to remember Mad Magazine? <laughs> <laughs> remember Alfred E. Newman? What we worry? I guess that's kind of what I'm talking about here today. Um, because it will come back to get you. It will get you, somehow or other. It will find you, it will get you. So I'm urging you to worry. I guess I was trying to be a little more provocative in terms of what can the public do. Right, right. Well, I think this election is the best place to, to turn your, your energies and your efforts, because it should be about Iraq and what this country is going to be facing in the next 10 years. It not, should not be about how we can make Iraq go away, which is what the candidates seem to want it to be about. It should be about what we as Americans will have to face in the next 10 years as a result of this war. And if, if the candidates can satisfactorily answer that question, then maybe they deserve our vote. If they can't, then I don't think they do. That's why we should, uh, that's what we can do with these worries of ours. Okay, thank you all so much. Really, thank you. I'm very honored, very honored.